Thanks to everyone so much for tuning in to Dreams Achieved tonight, and I hope you and all your loved ones are really doing well and safe. Uh, my name is Josh Weiss, and I've now been on the HFLS Next Gen Steering Committee for just over a year. Um, apologies in advance, my voice is a little bit hoarse. Um, I'm a big LA Chargers football fan, um, and I lost terribly in a screaming fight with my TV on Sunday. Um, but over the past year, it's been really amazing to see and experience firsthand how HFLS uses interest-free loans to help needy New Yorkers become financially self-sufficient. Uh, HFLS has now been there to help the community for 128 years, and the loans are really for a wide variety of uses, uh, including to help start small businesses, uh, cover medical costs, and to ensure children with special needs receive the education that they need. So the outbreak has obviously created intense need across the world, and HFLS has experience and is very well equipped to respond to these extraordinary circumstances. So I just wanted to quickly share some numbers with everyone that I feel really bring to life the impact uh, that HFLS has been able to make in 2020. So in early March, HFLS immediately halted four months of repayments from current borrowers, which led to an average of $1,000 in the bank accounts of lower income New Yorkers who struggle to meet basic needs such as food and, and rent, uh, we simultaneously launched the Coronavirus Financial Impact Loan Program, offering interest-free loans of up to $5,000 to lower-income New Yorkers, uh, distributed scholarships and cash grants totaling $1.8 million to more than 800 lower-income college and graduate students. We administered over $1.5 million in bridge loans for nonprofits facing cash flow problems uh, that were caused by delays in payments of government contracts. And this number really stood out to me from the video. Um, HFLS has provided now at, at this point nearly $12.6 million in financial relief to New Yorkers affected by COVID-19, which really speaks volumes to how incredible this organization really is. So while businesses have needed to adapt to the changes due to COVID, it's also really amazing to see that HFLS has also stepped up to the challenge and pivoted to support businesses' needs during this time. Uh, and it's really great to see we've made a tremendous difference in the lives of our borrowers. So unfortunately this year, you know, we can't schmooze uh, over sushi and drinks, but we still have an awesome set of panelists, all from different industries, who are gonna be sharing how business has been for them over the past eight months and how they pivoted to change their businesses around COVID. Uh, so as I promised to all my friends when I invited you to this event, uh, there is a trivia to test your knowledge of small businesses and we are gonna have some really great prizes to give out from various HFLS borrowers. Uh, so to participate, uh, just please click on the link that Shane is gonna put in the chat momentarily. Um, and I'll quickly just go over the prizes for the top three winners. So we have an exercise class package from JTW Fit. Uh, anyone who attended his event earlier during COVID can tell you for a fact he's going to kick your butt. Uh, a chocolate package from Netto Chocolate and monogram towels from the towel shop. So everyone has until 8.15 to submit your responses and then we'll share the answers at the end of the event. So good luck, everyone. Um, and now I'm going to kick it over to Andrew Dansker, uh, who's also a Next Gen Steering Committee member, and he's going to be moderating the panel tonight. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that very much. Um, and thank you to the HFLS Next Gen Committee for putting this together. I think that this is the best event of the year. I'm very pleased to be included in it and I'm very excited for tonight's conversation. I'd also like to thank the panelists um, who have made the time to join us uh, in this hectic time. And uh, we all really appreciate that and the opportunity to hear from you. Um, I was going, going to chat a little bit about 2020 and all of the um, challenges that 2020 has presented, health challenges, political challenges, uh, economic challenges. And then I thought to myself that no one really wants to hear my opinion on all of our challenges, that we have a great panel together to talk about those challenges. And those are the experts from the front line. So I'd like to invite all of them uh, to join us now. And uh, so we can do some introductions and so you can hear directly from them about 2020. Great, Diana's here, Danny's here, Garrick's here, and Shlomo, wonderful. So uh, what I'd like to do to start off with is I'd like to uh, invite each of the panelists to um, introduce themselves. What's your name? Where are you from? Uh, what is your business? Uh, maybe just very briefly about the business and then um, we'll start with some Q&A about, uh, about what you do and, and how we all got onto this panel together. Uh, Diana, you're in the top left of my screen. I don't know if you're open to starting, but if you are, go right ahead. Hi, my name is Diana. I'm from Long Island, New York. I own a um, facial bar. It's called Glow Labs Facial Bar. 
I started mid pandemic. That obviously was not the plan, um, but you got to adapt. And yeah, that's where I am now. I'm originally from Israel, moved here when I was six and family is Russian, but um, consider myself American. <laughs> Great, perfect. My background. Danny? Yeah, hi, I'm Danny Schatzkus, uh, founder of Gig Gear. We manufacture um, accessory products designed for professionals that work in live events, live entertainment, live sound, uh, all manner of production. And uh, yeah, that industry has been completely decimated. So <laughs> uh, we've got quite a story. <laughs> That's good. We're going to get into that. That's perfect. Uh, Garrett? Uh, my name is Garrick. I, I run an architectural design studio called 10 to 1. Um, we do a, I've been in business uh, eight years. We do a very wide range of projects, um, though a, a lot of them are uh, centered in uh, Brooklyn. Um, our projects range from furniture to, to houses and apartments to um, uh, uh, schools and restaurants and the, the kind of bigger um, scale of work is typically uh, pro bono, a lot of pro bono uh, school work. Uh, where, where did the name 10 to 1 come from? 10 to 1 odds, long odds, making something spectacular. I had a feeling that's what that was. That's great. And uh, HFLS is very own Shlomo. I am Shlomo Haft. I'm the director of the Micro Enterprise Program. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet all these people and hopefully help them pre-pandemic, during pandemic. Um, every, every instance was different, but um, you'll hear their stories and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to uh, add whatever you know, is asked of me. Good, great. Uh, well, that's perfect. Uh, thank you guys for those intros. I, I want to start, I want to go in the same order just because, well, it's making a lot of sense to me on my screen. Um, Diana, I want to start with you. I want to ask you to talk a little bit to the audience about how you decided to start your business, what that process was like. Um, I think for you, it's very recent and it's tied to HFLS. So, so a lot of things are tied together in that question, I think. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's my second career. My original career was marketing and marketing analytics. Um, I got into skincare because I've personally always had very problematic skin myself. And I feel like that's how a lot of estheticians get into it. Um, I was very stressed out because I hated my job and because of the stress, I was not doing well skin wise. And I started to look for a place near me that would be able to help me out. And everything I was finding were these like Eastern European women that just kind of like destroy your face for an hour and send you off and are like, see you later. Um, so I was looking for something that was more of like a holistic approach, like customized skincare. You come in, they talk to you, they tell you what you need to know, and they look at every single person differently and not kind of like a one size fits all um, skincare uh, routine and skincare journey. And um, we didn't have that on Long Island, but we had a few of those in the city. And I decided to go and get licensed as an esthetician. And I ended up working at one of those places in the city right out of school. And I was having girls come in from Long Island into the city from like deep Long Island and a lot of girls that were right where I live. And so there was clearly a need for it where I live because I was like, why are you in the city today? And they're like, literally just for this facial. And so I decided that there was a market for it, but we needed to adjust it to Long Island. It couldn't just be like a get in, get out kind of facial like they do in the city. Um, I wanted it to have that relaxing atmosphere at all as well. So I uh, went for it. I got in touch with the Hebrew Loan Society, Free Loan Society, because I didn't really have any other options. I was a, I was a newlywed. We just bought an apartment, no money in the bank. Um, but I really was very passionate about this. I knew I could do it. I had a lot planned. I had a lot already set up and it was just about expanding and needing the finances and the support to do so. Um, signed the lease beginning of March pre-corona. So as you can imagine, it's been a wild ride, but Shlomo and the Hebrew Free Loan Society have been absolutely incredible. They've made it as painless as possible. I actually have only had good experiences so far starting a business, shockingly. So yeah, only good things to say. 
That's pretty amazing for a year like this to be able to say that. Um, yeah. Danny, I think that your story is similar to Diana's in a way. I mean, it has nothing to do with uh, facial care, although you, you, you look great in the screen. So, you know, you can tell us what your routine is as part of the story. Um, but it was more about meeting, finding a personal need through your experience, right? And then, and then branching into something. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got started? That's right. Sure. Um, I'm, you know, first and foremost, uh, I'm a multi-instrumentalist musician. Um, and so my entire life, uh, I've always been performing and involved in music and sound and audio um, and, you know, involved in live events and entertainment. And um, it, throughout that, you know, part of my career, uh, there was kind of, you know, and I, I worked a lot in, in doing live sound, specifically rentals, uh, loading gear in and out of uh, events and spaces and parties and concerts and all that. And during the course of that time, I kind of always kept a list of products that I thought would be super helpful if somebody would just create this. You know, if somebody did this, that would make my life and probably a lot of other people's lives easier. Uh, and over time, that list got longer and longer and longer. And there were a whole bunch of them that really, really, I kept thinking this would be great. Um, and they just didn't come to fruition. So about uh, five years ago, I decided to take the leap and say, you know what, if no one else is making these, we're going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start making products. And I had never manufactured a thing in my life. Uh, had no clue how to go about it. I got very lucky being introduced to people in my community. And we started with one product line, very small batch runs and uh, just kind of snowballed from there. Um, and it's very niche, you know, it, I, I, we make products for the market and for the people that I know, but um you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a great community of people. And being that I, I worked in that industry for so long, it's kind of like, you know, you know exactly what people need. And, and if it's not there, we've got great insight into what we can do to create, to help make their jobs easier, safer, more efficient and all that. Great, that's perfect. Uh, Garrick, you also had a long career in the business before you started the business. Uh, like Danny, can you talk a little bit about how your firm started and, and how you got it off the ground? Yeah, um, I was hoping you'd start with a comment on my nice complexion, but I guess, <laughs> maybe I should use the services. You got to talk to Diana about that. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess so. Um, <laughs> so I um, I've been working in the city since the mid '90s. I, I moved to the city. I'd gone to. I grew up in Pittsburgh. Um, in a Brooklyn-like uh, neighborhood. Um, and I went to art school and, and um, had a kind of, uh, and, and did many things. I'd, al I'd always wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm wired to be my own boss um, for, for, or I'm wired not to work for anyone uh, except myself. Um, I like that phrasing because they're two different things, really. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, um, and I had I, I'm uh, I'm a third generation architect, and and it was uh, so for me it was kind of I was in denial for for <laughs> a while and tried many different avenues in the arts and graphic design and um, but I so I was kind of slowly you know living in the city younger and slowly getting into the business. And I went through, um, you know, worked at a, a lot of firms, a, a couple firms at, at a very uh, substantial, you know, very high level, um, lots of big projects. And I, I just, you know, as I said before, I was always kind of wired to do my own thing and my own, uh, it was a, a lot of that has to do with, um, my take on doing uh, work that is, you know, fo focusing, having the profession focus on um, equitable work and sustainable work. Um, there's, th there's so much of architecture is, you know, you're just following a private client. Um, and I wanted to do, uh, you know, the, the, you know, work on schools and, and more public um, um, projects. So, um, 
yeah. And also, I you know, there's another, I have kind of a design build model um, where I, I really get my hands dirty on projects. Um, and I, so I've kind of taken the passions and the critiques that I have of the profession and made, you know, that my particular plant here at the, at a 10 to one. And That's perfect. Yeah. Uh, Shlomo, I want to ask you something because I think that Diana and Garrick both embody things that I think are traditional paths for entrepreneurs. And I think Danny has both of them, which is either seeing a need that you want to fulfill or having a long career in a business and then wanting to do it your own way or a long history in a business and wanting to, to do your own spin on it. it are these traditional uh, roots that you see among your borrowers or, or are there themes here that we should understand as as typical of, of people who come to HFLS to borrow? I think the common thread if you look at, at the three panelists and um, what I see in just, a, just about every HFLS borrower is, is a passion about their field and um, they all have expressed that tonight one way or another they all have passion and that is, you know, I think we've said it in past uh, Dreams Achieved events where, you know, that's what entrepreneurs are. You know, they just, they have a passion for something and that's, um, and they also have, like uh, Garrick said, they're wired to work for themselves. They just can't work for someone else or they want to just work for themselves. Um, but you add that with a passion for their and I see that, I, you know, we've made loans to probably a hundred different types of businesses and everybody that walks in is passionate about what they, what they do. And, you know, one person could be selling a light bulbs on Amazon and they just like, they know about everything about every type of light bulb there is. And they're just passionate about that. And so that's, that's what I see, um, you know, and, and that's, what we look for, because if somebody's not passionate about something, um, they're not going to be good at it, and they're not going to dedicate twenty-five hours a day to it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I appreciate that, and I think that um, you know that is a nice segue into the next question I want to ask about, which is how each of the borrowers found HFLS. I think that um, you know there's. Um, a moment where each of these borrowers came to HFLS and I think passion was part, a large piece of that, either propelling them forward in a time of difficulty or in a time of optimism. And I want to hear it maybe in the same order, Diana, if you want to start about how you got to HFLS, how did you find HFLS? Why did you choose HFLS? What, what was that experience like for you? So I found HFLS online, just I was researching this day and night, kind of trying to figure out where the money is going to come from, um, because I really, I had no idea how this was going to work. And going into severe debt was something I was really trying to avoid because my husband does have school loans and we have other things, other bills and just adding more loans and more interest and all of that to that and going into severe debt, it just, it was very scary. And um, I, I like, I really didn't know that this exists. I didn't know that there was such a thing as an interest free, free loan. Like it just didn't make sense. Like how, how can somebody be so giving? Um, and I found this and I told my parents, it was like, what are the chances that like, this is legit. And my parents were like, no, that's very legit. And then I was speaking about loans to my friend's mom who's um, a doctor. And she was like, yeah, I got a loan from them back in the day when she was transitioning from being a doctor in the Soviet Union and to being a doctor here. There are certain courses you need to take that cost a lot of money that a lot of people leaving the Soviet Union did not have. Um, and she got a loan from the Hebrew Free Loan Society. And she was like, oh my God, they were so great and easy and you should definitely just see where it goes. And I honestly, I was I mean, I'm a 26 year old, but at the time I was 25, like who was going to give me money? <laughs> I was really nervous. Shlomo, I apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Shlomo, apparently. <laughs> Terrible <laughs> character. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and I was like, realistically, who's going to trust me? Who's going to believe in me? 
And I, it was kind of a leap of faith and I met with Shlomo and I told him, I told him my plan. I told, I kind of drew everything up for him. I had, I'm a planner. So I had like papers and binders and I was so fully planned out, but it was just the financing of it that I did not have. And I, it was obviously the only thing just in the way. And I, after meeting him, I was like, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It wasn't meant to be then. And it did. And I was so overjoyed. And uh, thankfully that carried through coronavirus. It's, it's been so amazing. The, the HFLS has just moved everything, like moved mountains for me to be able to do this. And I truly, I'm still so thankful and in shock that it, it has worked out and I'm here today. <laughs> so thank you again. That's fantastic. So uh, you came to HFLS uh, accidentally in a moment of starting things up. Uh, Danny, you came to HFLS in a different kind of moment in the middle of things, trying to make things run. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, we were in a, kind of a business accelerator program and one of the advisors there um, kept bringing up HFLS as a source of funding. Um, you know, as part of the program there, there we, we, we met with, uh, you know, bank loan officers and we learned about the SBA and all that. And one of the options that was always included was HFLS. Um, from the beginning, I was pretty, and I'm still, I've, I've still been pretty adamant that uh, I will, you know, anytime the company needs money, I've been trying to bootstrap it on my own. Um, I, I really loathe going into uh, you know, debt. Obviously, there's always a certain amount of debt that somehow needs to be carried. But, you know, I, I just the idea of paying somebody for money, <laughs> just, it seems a little crazy, but that's what loans are. Andrew, I know that's what you do. So sorry to knock, your, true. <laughs> sorry to knock your career there. But that's all right. Uh, you know, but like uh, Diana said, the idea of an interest free loan um, it, it sat with me much better. Um, and what happened was, is we, you know, had introduced a new product uh, a little over a year uh, prior. This was towards the end of 2019. And we decided to give, you know, Shlomo a call. We had been introduced to him. He had come and done a presentation at the Accelerator. And uh, we decided to say, you know what? Well, sorry, this product that we had introduced had been doing well. And we needed to fund another production run. Um, and... You know, it, it's it's a dicey thing being able to, you know, use revenue to fund your next production run and so on. And so, you know, you've got to have enough of it in order to be able to pay all your other bills. So we did. We needed an influx of cash. And it was more than I could have done on my own just to bootstrap it. So we met with Shlomo. Uh, you know, we got all our ducks in a row. I think he saw that, you know, how serious we were and, and, and like he said, how passionate we are about what we do and that um, we had a... a a history of growth and success and all that. And our loan was approved, um, I think somewhere about a month to a month and a half before the pandemic hit. But, you know, right when we got that money, we, we paid the deposit on the production run and everything. So it was so timely because we had, we had gotten that deposit in and, and production had started on the product. Unfortunately, later on, you know, COVID uh, hit overseas first. And so all the shipping lanes got shut down and everything. But the, the bottom line is we actually got the money right at the right time in order for the product to be ready. So that once the world started opening up everywhere else before it shut down in the US, our product was ready to come here and it gave us, it arrived and gave us something to continue to sell while trying to figure everything else out in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Um, Garrick, your, your coming to HFLS, I think happened in a very different time in your business. Diana was starting up. Danny was getting up and running. You were up and running uh, and you found your way to HFLS. How did you find HFLS and, and what was that experience like for you? Um, to, I need to kind of set the stage a little bit before I met um, HFLS to, to really uh, tell the story. So I had uh, the pandemic hit um, I had almost nothing in the bank. I, so I have, you know, not, not all um, businesses aren't uh, run. If you're, if, <laughs> if you're interested in running your own business, it's, it's not always a cakewalk and, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not always easy. 
Um, Eric, if you're an architect, you have to wait till you're like in your 90s to be famous. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. Knock on. Yeah. Everybody knock on wood, please. Yeah. Like late um, 80s, early 90s. Um, well, and, and, and as an architect, even a famous architect, you're probably not, you probably still don't have any money in the bank. Um, so I, the pandemic hit, I actually got sick. I was quarantined in, I quarantined in my office to protect my family uh, for a couple weeks. I had all this time. I was, everything stopped as it did for everyone. And I was, I'm sure everyone can, can relate. You know, I was panicked about groceries, um, like it, you know, in, in mid-March, um, you know, it was just like the apocalypse. Um, and I spent, uh, two weeks and then a few weeks after that after the quarantine every day 16 20 hours a day or something looking for financing hearing about city programs state programs um federal programs insurance you know loans grants and i got it was the most hellish uh runaround um even with like Citibank that I have a relationship with, I have a mortgage with, I've always paid my mortgage on time. They had nothing, I couldn't even, I think it took me two or three weeks just to get someone on the phone. Um, none of that was coming through, nothing. Um, and it was the, like the denial, you know, it was just uh, torture. I'd get close and then I wouldn't qualify for something for some reason, you know, like I couldn't prove that I was a small business, you know, it was really, crazy and I couldn't get anyone on the phone. Um, I'm sure lots of people can relate. And I just stumbled upon HFLS from a, from some, from a neighborhood group, I think. Um, so it was just word of mouth, completely random um, luck. And then like a day or two later, I'm on a FaceTime meeting with Shlomo and he's the first human I've interacted with in, you know, since the beginning of the apocalypse. And I don't, it's like, I'm a, you know, it sounds really cheesy, but it was like a mirage. It was, I didn't think that that would happen again. <laughs> and, and it was very welcome, um, you know, warmly welcomed. It was, it was, uh, it was not only very much needed money to kind of, um, uh, I forget the, the, the terminology, but like a stopgap, uh, like a, a bridge to just get me through for just keep things running and pay bills for a short period of time. Uh, but there is also that, you know, a, a, a somewhat personal um, approach and that it was, you know, the story of HFLS and it being interesting, you know, it was just really wonderful and, and kind of miraculous. So it was, it was very helpful and a very nice, uh, you know, sign of, um, uh, you know, humanity. <laughs> That's nice. That's a nice framing on a difficult time. Um, Shlomo, I'm curious to know, you know, I don't know if it's by your own design uh, or by coincidence, but our borrowers, you know, really represent here a uh, spectrum from Diana starting up to Danny ramping up to Garrick, you know, saving the ship. Um, to what extent is your experience with borrowers um, either one or all of these times in the cycle of a business? Is there one that you see more than others? Do you see more startups? Do you see more distress? Um, or is this typical? Do you see, meet and see borrowers and, and business owners in every part of the life cycle of their business? Well, I think the three panelists, you know, represent our borrowers overall. I think our borrowers from between March and June of, two, of 2020 um, kind of fit Garrick's story. Um, and borrowers from like before March and, and since July are more um, you know, Diana and Danny's stories. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a mix. But one thing I just wanted to add is that, you know, when Garrett said he couldn't find a bank, 
to talk to him, you know, when COVID hit, you know, most lenders just pulled back and HFLS really uh, took the initiative to create partnerships with different organizations that enabled us to make loans without guarantors, um, that enabled us to take more risk. So we actually went out there and tried to lend more even despite COVID. And I was just looking at the numbers, you know, our fiscal year is July through June, but I was looking at the calendar year. And in 2019, we lent uh, 1.9 million in the business, business loan. And in 2020, we're up to 1.5 million already. So we're probably not gonna hit 1.9 that we did last year, but we're gonna come pretty close despite COVID. Uh, you know, we've really been aggressively out there trying to lend as much as we can. Which is wonderful. Um, so I, I want to ask a, another question here uh, about COVID specifically. I, while I'm doing that, I want to invite the people in the audience uh, to start submitting questions through the question and answer box, so which is Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, that will give me a good idea of how many questions are lined up and how much time to leave to address those questions. Uh, so I appreciate that uh, if you have a question. Um, the, the question. The question I have uh, is about COVID. And the question I want to ask about COVID is, um, what has the experience uh, of running a business in this time been like for you? Um, I think that it's going to be universal to say that it's been difficult and stressful and bad. Uh, but I'm also curious to know, um, you know, has there been a silver lining here? Have you been forced to find new customers? Have you been forced to find the same customers in new ways? Have you been forced to produce new things? Um, you know, has there been a shift that, uh, born of necessity that's uh, helped the business even while the business was hurting? Uh, I feel like I'm picking on Diana a little bit, so maybe I'll switch to Danny or, and that way um, we can, we don't have to uh, surprise Diana with every question. Uh, not that your answers were bad and unthought through, Diana. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, Danny, uh, if you want to maybe take a stab at that, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Uh, I apologize. I, there's printing noise in the background. Somebody in the house just started printing something. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, we actually had a, a, major, a major change. You know, like I said at the beginning, um, when I introduced myself, our products are geared towards people that work in live production, live events, uh, live entertainment. That industry is non-existent right now, practically. I, I mean, it's, it's millions of people who are also happen to be our customers have been out of work for months or, or trying to find other things to do. Um, you know, venues are shut down, all that stuff. So almost overnight, our core customer base disappeared. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a sobering, uh, you know, type of, uh, event to go through, let alone the pandemic in general for an entire world to go through, but, you know, for a business owner to have your core customer base disappear practically overnight is, is, uh, not an easy thing to deal with. So it was kind of a, one of those moments of like, okay, what do we do? Um, and our, the philosophy behind the products that we had been manufacturing was always that we wanted to make the jobs of production professionals easier, safer, more efficient. You know, we wanted to help them in their work. So it was kind of a, well, if, you know, the world is moving to this work from home mentality, well, our core customer is not working in these venues anymore, but everybody's working from home. Well, let's make, how can we make people's work better? You know, that's still what we kind of aim to do. Um, and the idea was to now, you know, kind of shift over and make a work from home, you know, see if we could come up with a work from home product. And that's what we did. So you were asking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, changes, pivoting, whatever it is. Uh, we switched to, uh, we very quickly, I should say, created a product that uh, specifically addresses video conferencing like Zoom right now, and I've got it behind me right here. We created a screen that can mount onto your chair. It's called the Camelot. I guess these are the shameless pitches now on our, on our products, but um, <laughs> you know, 
people use green screens regularly. And I know that a lot of these uh, uh, video conferencing services have virtual backgrounds where you don't need a screen, but a lot of times they're not great. There's a lot of artifacts. And if somebody happens to walk next to you, suddenly they, you know, the computer registers it and you've got that floating ghost head thing going on. Um, or people have to be teaching or working from home and their spouse walks by in their underwear behind them or this and that. And, you know, or you've got a messy bedroom or dining room or kitchen that you don't want other people to see. And the idea was how can we separate your work from your private home? And so we created this uh, Camelot screen, which if I slide back, you'll notice obviously now my virtual background is there, but I'll, I'm, I'm quickly happy to show it to you if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take the uh, virtual background off. And it's simply a green screen on one side. On the flip side, it's actually white. So it's double-sided. Um, if somebody wants to use the green screen with, to make their virtual backgrounds better, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I can get up and kind of show you. It slides onto practically almost any chair. We've got patent pending on the strap that we use. Um, if they don't want to use the green screen, they flip it around and it can be white. So you just have a clean white background behind you. And the idea is to separate your work life from your home private life, if that's what you feel you need to do. Um, and so that has turned into our best-selling product. We've actually cannot keep it in stock. Um, we're sold out right now, um, waiting for more to come in. Um, and, you know, I have to say, even though, even though the HFLS loan was not initially used to fund the production of this product, but it did get us the other product that arrived for us to have something to sell during the course of the pandemic, which then ultimately helped us fund creating a new product, moving forward with it, getting samples, going into production and getting it here in a matter of a couple of months. So, um, you know, all of those steps, you know, with everything going on, that it, it kind of goes back to that initial phone call and getting in touch with Shlomo, not having a clue that any of this was gonna happen, but taking that HFLS loan and, and, and deciding to go for it couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't even begin to explain how timely and, and, and wonderful it was to have that in order to be able to keep us on this road. And you ended up with a best-selling product out of COVID, and, which I think is amazing. Correct. And, and we were, but at the same time, we were also able to, in a sense, stay true. You know, I mentioned before very quickly that I, I've come to not really like the term pivot. Everybody's using pivoting. Pivot means that you have to change. You know, our, our, our idea was that we didn't want to change who we were helping. You know, our, our goal is still to help people in the way that they work. Um, and so we didn't necessarily pivot. I'll give you one line. I was clued into this um, uh, phrase from Helen Keller. Uh, last week, someone clued me into it. And she once said, um, a bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. It's brilliant because... I mean, if you just think of it, if you don't make the turn, yeah, you're going to go off the road, hit a tree, fall off a cliff, whatever it is. But if you turn, you're still on the same road. So that's what we did. You know, we didn't pivot. We didn't go onto a different road. We just, we stayed the course. We stayed in the same direction. We're still, you know, doing what we had always intended to do. But right now we're just doing it in a little bit of a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and we do hope to now, you know, go back to our core customers once, uh, you know, um, the world gets a little bit back to normal. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, Diana, now that you've had time to think about your answer and plan out very carefully, uh, we have high expectations and everyone would like to know what your experience has been. And if there's also a silver lining in here, I mean, you signed a lease two weeks before quarantine started for a face-to-face -face business. So the challenge, I think, revealed itself very immediately. What do you do in a face-to-face -face business in a pandemic? So I like what Danny said about um, not so much pivoting and not so much changing course, but adapting. And that's basically what I did. Um, I adapted because there was, it was sink or swim at that point. Um, and I, I, I do, I am a silver lining kind of girl and I do think really great things came out of this. Um, for one, during quarantine, because I was shut down and I was obviously unable to see my clientele, um, I decided to start making, because my, my whole thing is, my whole business is making facials a part of your skincare routine. Like, you know, you go see your personal trainer and then you work out on your own, same idea. I'm your skincare personal trainer, and then you do your skincare at home to keep up with it. Um, and my whole thing was keeping up with it. And I was like, how am I supposed to do that when I can't 
help people face uh, face to face. So I started making these little facial kits that were customized for the person. And it came with instructions step by step how to like recreate a steamer if you don't have a steamer like I, I basically created a facial for people to be able to do at home from the comfort of their own home. And it shockingly took off um, it, over social media. And I really didn't think it was going to be as big of a hit as it was. And I was doing the deliveries. So um, I was driving all around Long Island and in Brooklyn. We have like one day where we just drop everything off in Brooklyn. And um, it was a lot of people, a lot of clientele that I would have never otherwise gotten. Um, and they suddenly were into self-care. Everybody was very into self-care during quarantine. So that helped me in the sense that people had more time to look at themselves and decide that like, I want to fix this. I want to do that. Um, so the facial kits really took off and I ended up getting a lot of clients for the, for the store from the facial kits that I was selling during quarantine. Um, as for reopening, it was all very uncertain and like what we didn't know when we we're going to be able to start doing face-to-face -face services. I was on this forum on Facebook and it was just all of us kind of like, Hey, heard anything? Nope. Okay, cool. <laughs> like, I guess we continue waiting. But in the process, it let me kind of think of ways of once I am open, how do I ensure I stay that way? And I thought of um, memberships and making it, uh, giving people great deals on this membership. We have a salt cave, which is now included within the membership. Um, you get a facial at a discounted rate. You come in once a month. You have it as part of your monthly routine. You get your nails, hair, and face done. Um, and well, not for me, but like that's part of the routine that people have. Um, and I wanted myself to be included in that. I wanted it to be a habit. And um, the nice thing about memberships, of course, if we shut down, it's on pause and I'll start doing the facial kits again. Um, but when we reopen, it gives people that like that push to like get back into it, get back into the swing of things. Um, and I, I really am very excited about the memberships. And a lot of people have really been loving it because they're like, wow, like this like gets me in, gets me to go, go. And I feel so much better for it. And I feel like I'm really taking care of myself and my face is thanking me for it. Um, but yeah, and then the real big change that I've had to make with being face to face is obviously the mask, the shield and the disinfection pra uh, practices. Um, estheticians are already are really careful with our disinfection practices, practices, we're dealing with people's faces. Um, but now there is an even more thorough um, disinfection with every single client. So it's changed my spacing between clients where I used to be able to do it like 10, 15 minutes between clients. We now have half an hour between every client to properly disinfect and make sure that the room is just pristine before the next person comes in. So that's been the real big change in that sense. Um, perfect. Thank you. That's a, that's a lot of stuff. I mean, it's, it's your business model. It's a new product. I mean, it's a few things at once. Um, which I think it's great. That time that we gave you to think about that really paid off. Um, <laughs> so Garrick, I want to ask you about changes in your business. Also, uh, it's 818. Uh, Rachel Chasky told me if I go past 820, I'm not going to be invited back next year. Mm -hmm. So very briefly, I'd like to ask you about changes in your business that, you, that you've experienced besides obviously the absolute terror of everything shutting down. Has there been a silver lining? Uh, this, the, I have had a lot of silver linings. Um, I mean, I, I have to say first that the silver lining of having a more balanced life and having, like I have my kids Legos in the background has, has been, um, uh, incredible. Um, also though, th there are certain, uh, you know, strictly in terms of business, there were smaller things like the efficiency of video conferencing while I'm at the office and, you know, contractors at, uh, at, at all hours are on site or a client is at home um, saves me many, many hours. And I'm, I'm now doing that more um, then I did, I've now continued to do that now that you don't, you know, absolutely have to. And, um, that's really helping. And it's, it's actually a, a better way 
uh, to, to meet and get things done in, in many regards. Um, I've got employees who have left the country, left the continent, and I'm still working with them because we can work remotely. Um, I've actually found, and then just a couple more quick things. I have now, now that we're kind of, I mean, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, but we're in a, in a way we're kind of learning how to live with the pandemic. The housing market is such that I'm seeing more clients come because of my kind of um, flexible, you know, design build, um, you know, a wide range of budget and uh, work with what you got kind of a business model. I have a lot of people you know, either sitting at home saying, oh, I want to renovate my house because I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm stuck here now a lot more <laughs> and just thinking about that or uh, that it's a good time to, I'm finding that it's a good time to buy a fixer upper these days where it hadn't, that hadn't been the case for a long time. Uh, and, um, and then lastly, the pro bono work that I've always has been a, a core, the core of the office disappeared. And I was like fundraising for getting laptops for kids. I went from like organ build designing campuses to trying to scrounge up laptops to now I'm finding because of philanthropy and more attention on uh, giving and other, you know, name, you know, communities that don't have as much as others that there's more, I'm finding pro bono projects come back to life actually more than they had before, like real, you know, shovel on the ground projects. So it's actually been really positive in, in many ways. Um, but as, as, you know, as Danny said, you have to, that's the kind of, you know, get, running a business is like having, <laughs> It's like having, you know, your, the best day of your life and the worst day of your life every day. So, you, you know, you have to, this is a very extreme version, but it's just what you, it's just the kind of thing that you have to be good at adjusting. Yeah. Speaking of adjusting, Rachel told me that I could have an extra few minutes. If I circle back to Diana's question and ask Shlomo, what is your hair, nails and facial routine? Well, I actually have a theory because um, my father-in-law is 92 and he gets a mani-pedi every couple of weeks. And I think that's why women live longer than men. You think so? <laughs> I think that uh, every man should incorporate a mani-pedi into his, his routine. <laughs> uh, Shlomo, besides adding a mani-pedi to your routine, uh, what other changes have you seen in this environment. I mean, each of these borrowers, I think, has spoken really eloquently to, you know, what we already know that this is a terrible situation, but that there is through perseverance and hard work, opportunity and, and upside. Um, have you seen that with other borrowers? Um, um, I well? have. I, well, uh, two quick uh, scenarios. One is uh, there was a restaurant owner in Jackson Heights, Queens. He was doing mostly takeout. And he had to close because his landlord just was not getting flexible on the, on the rent. So he ended up um, moving out and opening up a food truck that he now parks in front of his old restaurant. So he basically has the same customers, but he's not paying rent. Yeah. Um, the, other, the other scenario was a, uh, a woman and her aunt were, uh, they're making barrecas and selling them at, a, uh, at food at street fairs. And then when the pandemic hit, so there's no more street fairs. So they didn't know what to do. They figured they're out of business. They go, wait, let's start freezing them. And let's start selling them wholesale to supermarkets. So uh, they came to us for a loan because business was taking off. And they wanted to go to a third party uh, food, food producer that would make you know, a big run of their barrecas. So they needed a loan, which we gave them. And now they're talking to... Uh, Fresh Direct and other large supermarkets. And so, you know, I know we don't like the word pivot, but somehow they, they made the turn. Yeah. And um, they're, you yeah. know, without COVID, I don't know if they would have thought about, hey, let's freeze these. Why are we selling them on a street fair? So yeah. 
sometimes opportunity comes up uh, despite um, you know adversity. Beautiful. Um, all right. So Diana, Glow Labs, Danny, Gig Gear, Garrick, Ten to One Architecture Studio. Thank you each for the time you spent with us. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. It was really great. Um, one of the questions I saw pop up was, how do I contribute to HFLS? That's definitely a question that is great to hear. And you should ask that question of whomever it is that invited you uh, to the event. And you should also check out the HFLS website um, for the answers to those questions. Uh, I now turn it over to Shana to wrap us up. Thank you, Shana. Hi everyone, I'm Shana Foreman. I co-chair the Hebrew Free Loan Society Next Generation Steering Committee of which Andrew and Josh are both members. Um, first of all, thank you to Diana and Garrick, Danny and Andrew and Shoma for taking part in our panel tonight and sharing your stories and also just showing us why all of our support of small businesses really matters, especially right now. So on to our trivia game. Thank you to everyone who participated. Um, we did this to share some knowledge and also just help all of us learn more about the impact that we can make when we support small businesses. So first I will go through the answers and then I'll share our winners and the prizes that you guys are winning. So first of all, number one, what percentage of businesses in New York City have under 20 employees? The answer is 89%. That is a lot of small businesses in New York City. Among businesses with less than 20 employees, which industry employs the most people in New York? The answer is accommodation and food services. Before the pandemic, what percentage of small businesses in New York State sought financing in 2018? 52%, and that's, I mean, to me, that seems huge that that was even before we went into this pandemic, that 52% of small businesses were seeking financing. What percentage of small businesses survive five or more years? 50%. 85% um, of small business owners say the best way to get new customers is through, and the answer is word of mouth. That really stuck out to me because it made me just personally think about how much I can support small businesses in my community, just sharing about them with people I know, and I think we can all do that. And then in fiscal year 20, HFLS provided loans to immigrants from more than how many different countries? And that includes both small business loans and personal loans. And the answer is over 70 different countries. Um, HFLS provides a lot of um, loans to immigrants. So whether it's through the Hebrew Free Loan Society or through just making the decision to shop local this holiday season or telling your friends about a small business you support or supporting the small businesses we heard from tonight, um, we can all really help them persevere and they need our help now more than ever. So to share our top three winners, we will follow up with you after the event. Third place goes to Audrey Penn. Second place is Eddie Antar and first place is Carrie Weiss. So congrats, you guys. Um, and we'll follow up with you. And you will each be either getting an exercise package from JTW Fit, a chocolate package from Netto Chocolate, or monogram towels from the Towel Shop, which are all um, small businesses in New York City who've received funding for, from HFLS. So to wrap things up tonight and a couple just quick last announcements, this event has been hosted by the Next Generation Steering Committee. We are the Hebrew Free Loan Society's group of socially conscious young professionals who support and advocate for HFLS through events, volunteering, fundraising, and educating the next generation of leaders. So if you're interested in learning more, getting involved, please reach out. You can respond to any of the emails you received about the event or reach out to whoever you heard about this from um, and we will be in touch. And also, if you were inspired by the stories you heard tonight, um, you can support these businesses. We'll be sending you an email afterwards with links to their websites. And we also have so many other businesses who've received loans from the Hebrew Free Loan Society who you could support too. So we're actually gonna include an, a bigger selection of businesses in the email too. And 
you know, as you're thinking about buying holiday gifts this season or anything like that, um, it's great to potentially consider um, shopping with some of these businesses. Um, and also if you or anyone you know is in a tough financial spot and lives in New York City, let them know about the Hebrew Free Loan Society. Um, everyone we heard from tonight received small business loans, but we also um, provide loans for people personally through a wide variety of different programs. Um, and like the video you saw at the beginning, um, we have uh, provided over um, a, a really large amount of money or for COVID relief loans. Um, so please let people know that they can still apply for those. And then last thing, um, we're excited to launch our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign next week. Um, the events that we host throughout the year are typically free or just at cost. So our fundraising campaign is the one time per year that we raise money for HFLS. So thank you all 72 of you who joined us tonight. Um, and that is it. And we hope you all have a great night.